Um, okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're excited today to have Ted Yoder visiting us from MIT. Uh, Ted has been a PhD student at MIT, working with uh, mostly with Ike Chuang, but you've collaborated with quite a few people in your yeah. in your uh -huh. various research work. Um, I think you know his main interest has been fault tolerance and error correction. Although Ted has also worked in space of quantum algorithms and even some control and composite mm -hmm. pulse sequences and other things. So uh, we're we're excited to have Ted here uh, today and yesterday as well. Um, he's going to speak with us this morning about the universal transversality um, you can achieve with Bacon Shore codes. So okay. Welcome, Ted. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Krista, and thanks everyone for for showing up. Um, Right, so this is, well, you can see the archive link here. It's pretty recent work from earlier this year on, uh, on doing universal, a universal set of gates transversely on Bacon short codes. And um, you know, uh, there is this word floating around called uh, trans-universality, <laughs> sort of a, a coined word where you uh, switch between different codes using gauge fixing to achieve a universal set of gates. And this sort of fits inside that paradigm. Um, but, you know, if you don't know what trans universality means, then uh, you can just think of this talk as explaining this circuit here to implement control control Z. Um, so let's start with an introduction of the, the, these Bacon Shore codes. Uh, these are subsystem codes. So there are actually um, Gauge operators are the important uh, set of polys. Uh, there are gauge operators ZZ type between qubits in the same row, and also gauge operators XX uh, between qubits in the same column. Um, and uh, the, the logical operators of this code are like a string of poly Zs along a column is, is logical Z, and a string of poly Xs along a, a row is logical X. And this encodes one logical qubit. Um, so what's so great about these Bacon Shore codes? Well, they're very, the, very simple. They're essentially the first code that was ever discovered um, by like Peter Shore in, in 1996. Um, it's a concatenation of, of the classical redundancy codes. Um, and along with that conceptual simplicity comes uh, a very easy way to like prepare the code states because their code states are essentially just cat states. And if you can prepare and verify against errors these cat states, then you could make bacon short code. Um, and essentially, it, yeah, I mean, this is like fault tolerant computing with just a, 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 um, a, a big batch of cat states, essentially. So you can imagine this like, uh, this, this talk is somehow, uh, or, or quantum uh, computing is somehow fault tolerant with just cat states. Um, and it, it also does universal computation with just cat states. So it's sort of an interesting interpretation. Um, uh, it's a 2D uh, subsystem code, which is important for implementation because you can lay these qubits out, as I've done here, in a grid. Um, and uh, also important for implementation is that the, these gauge operators are weight two, so they're like pretty easy to measure. Um, and it does have a compelling, uh, relation to the surface code, you can switch between the surface code and Bacon short code by uh, fixing a gauge. Like the surface code gauge is just one choice of gauge for the Bacon short code. Uh, now what do I mean when I say fix a gauge? I mean uh, choose like a maximally commuting set of, of gauge operators. Uh, there's one very common gauge that we're going to be using in this talk called the Z gauge. So in the Z gauge, um, we take all these, uh, these pairs of Zs as our stabilizers. Um, so that's what this little schematic is supposed to be indicating. Uh, we take all the pairs of Zs as stabilizers and also uh, these, big, uh, these big blocks of X that span two rows and also span the, all the columns. Oh, uh, I'm imagining with boundary, yeah. Yeah, um, you, it can wrap around if you want. Yeah. Um, in this case, the, the extremes uh, over, over the row, would be um, uh, That doesn't change anything. You can, you can do that if you'd like. Yes. It doesn't change anything because, like, 
you know, if, if this operator is in the gauge for all neighboring pairs, then you just multiply them together and you, and you get like this operators in the gauge. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so th this is a very nice simple set, uh, code and the question is how can we compute with them? Um, so to compute with them, there are, there are several limitations that you have to overcome. So the, the first of these is the easton Knill theorem, uh, which just says that um, if you partition the qubits in the code somehow, uh, called a transversal partitioning, then the set of unitary gates that you can do with respect to that partition, um, so, so the gate is transversal with respect to that partition if it only, if it acts as a tensor product over that partition. Uh, but the set of gates you can do that way is, is finite. So it's a finite group, actually. Um, which means, in particular, you cannot do universal transversal computing. Um, now, how do you get around this? Well, you could, you could do this gauge fixing, and this is what the trans universality is. Um, so, for instance, this is done in the color codes to go from like a 2D color code to a 3D one. Uh, the 2D one has all your Clifford gates, and then the 3D one has your T gate. Um, so we could do a similar thing with the Bacon shortcode, actually. So uh, the symmetric Bacon shortcode has transversal H up to the qubit, part uh, qubit permutation. Um, and the asymmetric Bacon shortcode, as I'll explain in this talk, has transversal CCZ. So uh, if we can gauge fix between these, and actually you can by preparing an appropriate ancilla and sort of merging the code blocks, uh, when you switch between these, you get a, a universal set of gates. You get H and CCZ, which is universal. Um, another solution is you could just teleport in gates. So if you don't want to do the switching, you could just always have your data in the asymmetric code, but then whenever you want to do an H gate, you prepare an ancilla and do this teleportation, so get this one bit teleportation. Because yeah? What's the threshold for the bacon shortcuts? So bacon shortcuts do not have a threshold. Um, this is, yeah, I mean, it's a downside, but it's not necessarily catastrophic um, because uh, there's still a value of logical error rate that they can reach for any given physical error rate. Um, and I guess I didn't prepare any slides on this, but uh, there's, a, there's a paper by John Knapp and John Preskill uh, that says on the symmetric Bacon short codes, um, if you have a physical error rate of 10 to the minus 3, you can achieve a logical error rate of 10 to the minus 28. So why do you need a logical error rate any lower than 10 to the minus 28? <laughs> is, is the question. Um, I, I don't think you would ever. But. Was that number including all the possible possibilities? So it was uh, not including measurement errors. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, we'll talk about measurement or error correction in the Bacon short code uh, soon. Um, the second limitation is uh, this bravi koenig theorem, which says that in, in D dimensions, if you have a topological code, um, then uh, the the logical circuits that are implement uh, the logical gates that are implemented by local circuits uh, can only achieve the dth level of the Clifford hierarchy, um, and because any finite level of the Clifford hierarchy is not universal, then uh, you also cannot get a universal set of gates. Um, and in our case, we have a two-dimensional code, so uh, 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 ostensibly. Uh, we would only be able to choose uh, to implement gates from the Clifford uh, from the Clifford group, the second level of the hierarchy. Um, and Pestovsky uh, and Yoshida uh, say a similar thing for subsystem codes um, with threshold. Um, but uh, you can get around this by using circuits that are not constant depth. So you could do like lattice surgery and, and braid things. Um, you can also get around this by using uh, circuits and codes that are not local. Um, so if you don't have local stabilizers and also your, your circuits can couple qubits at that long range. Um, so uh, how is this relevant for the Bacon Shore case? Well, we use the Bacon Shore co uh, code in the Z gauge. 
So there are actually v these very big X stabilizers that span, span the entire code. Um, so th these are not local codes, at least the Z gauge ones aren't, even though you can measure these stabilizers locally. Um, and, and the circuit contains, uh, the circuit for our CCZ, um, I didn't show it here again, but it contains gates that actually span the lattice. Um, so we'll see that that's somewhat important. Okay. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is uh, why asymmetry is important in our construction. Um, so, and, and I'm going to do this by arguing that on symmetric codes, uh, constant depth circuits can only implement logical, uh, Clifford logical gates. Um, so imagine you have this, uh, this shouldn't be here yet, but imagine you have this patch of surface code or Bacon short code, and you have some logical operator here, some poly logical operator, some string. Um, this has a size or support that is order M, and when you apply, when you apply U to, uh, to this poly operator, uh, its support can change, right? So we can map we can map G1 to the commutator of U and G1. Uh, but the commutator of U and G1 also has to have support of the same size. So it also has support of order M. Um, now the key is that when we look at another logical operator, uh, we can shift this logical operator anywhere uh, any, to any latitude. And so we can always find an implementation of this logical operator that intersects K1 uh, in some constant number of places. So let's say we choose this G2 prime right here. Then it, it intersects only at this, this like constant number of places. So the, the support of this double commutator will also be constant size. And if the support of the double commutator is constant size, then it must be uh, the logical identity operator because it doesn't have support in a, in a large enough region to, be, to do a logical gate. Um, and if the double commutator is identity for all pairs of G1 and G2, uh, then U is Clifford. Okay, so this is a, a rough sketch of the argument that, that uh, constant depth circuits on symmetric codes will just, will just uh, give you Clifford gates. Um, so what changes in the case that you uh, have an asymmetric code. Well, now uh, your, one of your logical operators is m squared in size. So it can map to a region like this, which is m by m. Um, and now, no matter which implementation of G2, so we choose the same, same poly operator in this case, no matter which implementation of G2 you choose, you know, at any latitude, it's going to intersect this region in order m, which is the code distance. Um, so therefore, the double commutator uh, will have uh, support that is equal to the code distance, and you cannot rule out the possibility that that is implementing a, a non-trivial logical operator. Um, and there's another way to do this, where you, where you map G1 to blocks like this. And the advantage of doing it this way is that the, the gates that uh, in U would only have to have range that sort of map, um, you know, the vertical distance of the code, as opposed to, as opposed to somehow mapping, you know, diagonally across this way. Um, right, and now uh, this is actually published as well, um, so I should, probably should have put the archive link. But this is a recent paper with, with Thomas and Alex. Um, okay, uh, so that brings us to the main result, which is these, which is this transversal circuit here on uh, the Bacon shortcode for control control Z. Um, and as promised, it's asymmetric. It's on an asymmetric code, and the gates uh, also have range that that spans the code in the in the columns. Um, so what is being pictured here are the three code blocks. The the big uh, circles is code block A. Uh, code block B is the, the medium-sized ones, 
and then code block C is the smallest ones. And uh, the, the colored lines represent control control Z gates on the physical qubits. Um, so you, this control control Z gate couples these three. Uh, this one couples the, the second qubit of the first code block, the second of the second, but you know, this qubit of the third. And the colors are just here to, to sort of guide, guide your eye uh, rather than uh, that all of these are control control Z gates. Doesn't matter what color they are. Um, and uh, you can also generalize this construction to uh, k qubit controlled Z on m by m to the k gates. Um, OK. So now I'm going to go into the argument of. Oh, um, we're doing a logical control Z gate, and every bake and shore code block uh, has one logical qubit. So we need three code blocks of bake and shore. Um, and uh, just to, to visualize this, I made each code block a different size qubit. But they're all qubits. Yeah, that's right. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, right. Okay. Um, so the way that we, uh, the proof that this can, it actually implements control control Z uh, uses this round robin trick, um, which I, you know, worked on with Ryuji and Ike at MIT. Um, so. It's easier to explain how to make control Z than it is to explain how to make control control Z. So we're going to explain how to make control Z. Um, this is the construction. So you, you, for any two stabilizer codes, you take the support of logical Z in the first code and the support of logical Z in the second, and you connect all qubits in all ways. You know, so there are, you know, if this is distance D and this is distance D, uh, then uh, there are d squared control z gates here. Um, and the claim is that this implements control logical control z between the code blocks. OK, so how to prove that. Um, let's say we have these two code blocks and we have logical z's. Uh, we can always convert these into you know, if logical Z here is implemented by some arbitrary polys, we can always convert this to just poly Zs by some single qubit Cliffords. Uh, so let's just assume that the, the logical Zs are strings of Zs. Uh, then we can introduce an ancilla qubit here um, and write the value of logical Z from the code block A into the ancilla. Right, so at this point, uh, the ancilla is showing the value of this logical qubit, whether it's whether this logical qubit is zero or one. We've made like a cat state between the code and and the unencoded qubit. Um, and then you can use this value of logical z a uh, to apply logical z b to the second code block. And uh, and then you erase the value of logical z a from the from the uh, from the ancilla. So at the, at the end, the ancilla is back in zero. Um, so this, uh, I, it, should, it should be clear that this implements logical control Z between the two code blocks. Um, and now the, the point is to just rearrange the circuit um, to get, s to uh, first of all, get rid of the ancilla. Uh, and well, yeah, to get rid of the ancilla, basically. Um, so how do you do this? Well, let's interchange this control not and this control Z gate. And when we do that, we pick up an extra control Z gate between the controls. Uh, it's just a circuit identity. Um, and then we can keep doing that, so moving this control Z gate all the way over. And we pick up control Z gates uh, from all the qubits here to the, to the first qubit down here. And this control Z gate now disappears because it's controlled on zero. So we can get rid of that. And uh, just repeat the same process, moving these 
control NOT gates through these control Cs till we end up with every qubit in the top connected to every qubit in the bottom. Um, and now the, the ancilla is also bare, so we can get rid of it. Uh, it's not involved in any gates. And uh, we call this the round robin construction. Uh, it's round robin because every, everybody up here meets everybody down here. Um, the round robin trick can be generalized then to implement control control Z on any three stabilizer codes. Uh, just by connecting every qubit in the support here to every qubit in the support here, every qubit in the support here. Uh, so just as you'd expect. And uh, the reason this is important is this is like a, well, this is a non-Clifford gate. It's from the third level of the Clifford hierarchy. And it's uh, also universal when you have H as well. Okay, so, um, right, so the, the Next trick, the, the next trick is, uh, this isn't very, oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, so you, your code, if your code has a transversal control phase, uh, maybe it's better to go here. So you write the value of, Z bar A. Yeah. Uh, it, sh it will work, yeah. So I think uh, you can derive like the Canil, Laflamme, Zurich. Uh, they, they do the control phase on two Steam codes, right? Um, you have to somehow implement control. Like the, the bottom code has to have a control phase somehow. And in the Steam code case, it's transversal. Yeah, I, th I mean, this has to be controlled logical phase, and it, that has somehow has to be compiled into to gates. And, um, yeah, but if it's if phase is transversal, then uh, you can do the same circuit rearrangement. And, I mean, the, the reason this sort of works for any stabilizer code is that the polys are natively transversal on any stabilizer code. So, uh, you know, you could do this. You could do this gate actually with any, replacing these uh, controls with any poly. Um, okay, yeah. So the uh, circuit on the, the previous slide, okay. This isn't fault tolerant. <laughs> uh, the reason it's not fault tolerant is that uh, if you have any like X error on one of these qubits, then it's going to uh, propagate Z errors to the exactly the support of logical Z bar on the other code blocks. So like it's, it's like strongly not fault tolerant. So then the the question is how do you make it fault tolerant? Um, there's well the, there's one trick that you know in our paper we we uh, talk about is doing error correction in the middle of the circuit to catch those X errors that would spread out of control. Um, so you could do that. Or if you have a special code like the bacon short code, uh, you can do what I'm calling code space compiling. So uh, the essential observation is that within one row, uh, you have this stabilizer. And um, if you have this stabilizer ZZ, then this is also a, a logical identity operation. You can take any ancilla qubit and controlled on that qubit apply ZZ. This will be logical identity. Um, so we can always just, just uh, put this circuit and uh, multiply any circuit on the code by this because it's just identity. So for instance, uh, here's here's our round robin circuit. You know, every qubit in logical Z of the one code is connected to every qubit in logical Z of the other code. Uh, let's just look at the orange part um, to make it clearer. 
and say that we want to move uh, this control Z gate. Um, how do we move that control Z gate? Well, we multiply by this identity circuit. You know, call this qubit A, and uh, do this do the, do this circuit. Um, now these control Z gates cancel, and we've moved we've moved the red control Z gate over one step. Um, so you can do this repeatedly to to spread out these CZ gates like this. And you can do that with the other, you know, the green and the blue ones that I, God bless you. You can do this with the green and the blue ones that I uh, suppressed earlier. So in the end, you get a, a logical control Z gate that is transversal. I mean, it's step one on the, on the symmetric Bacon short codes. Um, does that make sense? So. Mm. While preserving the one? Um, so, no, I believe you cannot. Um, yeah, it's, you can, you can prove you cannot because um, there are um, many implementations of logical X at every row. And if you're a proper logical control Z gate, then you have to map logical X to logical Z. Um, and logical X is like in one row, and if your circuit is local, then there's no way it can map logical X to logical Z along one column. So, uh, yeah, that's the rough sketch of the argument. That's impossible. Um, right. So in the control control Z gate uh, case, that's how you derive the circuit. You just sort of spread the control control Z gates out. Okay. Um, okay, so we have a procedure to do control control Z, and also we can teleport in Hadamard. So the remaining parts of computing with the Bacon short code is actually encoding it and uh, well, decoding it or, or like doing error correction. So the encoding part is relatively simple. If you want to prepare plus in the Z gauge, then you can just prepare M of these cat states uh, with each length N. If you want to uh, prepare zero in the X gauge, then you can prepare N of these cat states, uh, each with length M, you know, along the columns. Um, so these, these uh, logical encoded states are actually very simple. They're just uh, tensor products of cat states. Um, and why are these states important? Well, these are the ones that you can use for error correction. So you can do what's called Steen error correction using just these cat states. Um, and well, these are the circuits here. So uh, this figure A will measure all of the uh, X gauge operators, and this figure B will measure all of the Z gauge operators. And it measures them all at once in just one shot. Um, you, like, you don't have to repeat this because of measurement errors. Um, in the, and in the smallest case, where, where M and N are both three, uh, then you can get away without even verifying these cat states because you can prepare three qubit cat states uh, with faulty gates and still at most one error uh, will exist on the, on the output state. Um, right, so uh, the, the, the other step is actually measuring the logical data. So measuring the logical data uh, is easy because this is a CSS code. So you can just measure the qubits transversely. Um, it would be, so, so what I'm going to do next is um, reduce this 3 by 9 construction we had for control, control Z to just 3 by 3. And, uh, and uh, still, still making it fault tolerant, but it will not be transversal anymore. Um, and the motivation for doing that is the 3 by 3 case is very simple. 
uh, because you can, you can do this error correction with just no post selection. Okay. So here's a circuit for doing logical control control Z on the three by three bacon shore. Um, okay, let me try and talk you through this. Uh, the, this picture here is, um, is taking place in the first column of the three bacon shore code blocks. Right, so in the first column, we have a depth three circuit where C0 is this circuit, C1 is this one at time one, C2 is this one at time two. And uh, so this is taking place in column one. Um, you have C0, C1, C2. In column two, you have C0, C1, C2, but there's a permutation of some of the qubits. Um, it's not too important what this is, but it's just like a cyclic shift of the first and third code blocks. These just like shift in opposite directions. Um, and, and in column three, you also have C0, but now the permutations apply twice. Okay, so, so this circuit implements logical control control Z, uh, but it's not transversal. It, I mean, it like takes three time steps. Um, so then the question is, how do you do error correction at the end? Um, and, and the claim is that you can uh, do error correction by measuring all of the uh, Z gauge operators and then applying a correction that consists of X and control Z operators. Um, why, why is it X and control Z? Well, the, if, if X errors occur in the circuit at any time, then they'll propagate through these control control Z gates and cause control Z errors. Um, so you want to correct those control Z errors before you measure uh, the X gauge operators. Uh, like the X gauge operators will collapse those control Z errors and, and uh, then you might not be able to correct them. Um, but, but after you correct them, you can measure the X gauge and then you apply, apply Z corrections. So this is the correction step. And I'm not going to go into like, you know, the proof of why it works or anything, but this is, you know, this is one optimization that you can do for the, the three by three uh, bacon shore code. And um, I guess the sort of neat thing is that uh, this required no post selection at all because uh, you prepared the ancilla states for this Steen error correction by just making three cubic cats. And um, if you wanted to, to go to higher distance codes, you could concatenate this, and it would have a threshold and everything. Um, and you would still need no post selection. So this is like, you know, if you had a, an implementation that allowed like concatenation, uh, or an experiment that allowed, you know, that could implement these concatenated big and short codes, uh, then you would never need any post selection in your, in your uh, fault tolerant computer. Um, I, I don't know, it's, it's sort of neat to me, but not, not very practical, I guess. Um, okay, so we have this very small uh, bacon short code, CCZ, and then the question is how, uh, well, how does it perform in like, you know, some experimental setting? And how does it perform relative to magic states, uh, which is the other way to implement control control Zs? Um, so, uh, just to like choose an experimental implementation, I chose this ion trap uh, music queue architecture. Um, so this is like by Chris Monroe and others, and uh, the uh, well, the the gist is that you have qubits in these separate separate traps. They're ELUs elementary logical units, and you have about 100 qubits in each of these. And, uh, but you don't actually get to use all of those qubits. Half of them are just communication qubits. Uh, because you actually want to, to implement gates between the different traps, so you have to establish entanglement between ions in different traps. And you do that through this, you know, this photonic interference stuff uh, here. Um, so these communication qubits are actually just in bell pairs between the different traps. And you can, you can teleport 
uh, your data back and forth between. Um, the important thing for us is that the, the gates here can be non-local. Like you can get, within an ELU, you can interact any two qubits that you want. And between ELUs, you can interact qubits by, by teleporting gates. Um, there is some limitation to this locality, but it, it hardly ever comes up in our, in our simulations. Like, uh, you know, they, they say a realistic thing might be that you can only apply 12 uh, two qubit operations in parallel. Um, so, so we'll use that, but it's, it's not actually a big deal. Um, and they also give estimates for the gate times, uh, but these are highly idealized. Like nobody has all of these gate times yet. Yeah. So are you using some sort of a strategy for an angular distillation, or are you just uh, uh, writing it down? I am just assuming that the entanglement was prepared beforehand, and um, not factoring that into the time of running an algorithm. Okay, so uh, then the thing to do is to compare uh, the overhead of our circuits with the circuits for magic state distillation on the seven qubit code and magic state distillation on the nine qubit code. Uh, you know, the same shore code, that's the bacon shore three by three. Um, so this is our construction and these are magic state distillations. Sorry? Oh yeah, it's... Uh, it's right here. Um, <laughs> I knew you'd ask. <laughs> um, so we, uh, you know, we start with this state, the plus plus zero, and then we measure this this Clifford operator twice. And um, you do have to do error correction in between here. So so we're assuming nothing's perfect here, right? Like, no Clifford operations are perfect. Nothing, nothing is given to you for free. <laughs> um, this is all taking place at the, like, the lowest distance three level of the computer. So everything here is distance three. Um, right, so this is how you prepare the, the control, control Z state. And this is the circuit for injecting that control, control Z, uh, which does logical control, control Z. Mm -hmm. Especially given that the cost of magnetic distillation aren't catered to this. Mm -hmm. So, do you have any rough idea, uh, like an order of magnitude if you included those costs, where the bottom row would end up going? Um, I'm. I think actually that because the bottom row ends up using fewer qubits overall, like it will fit in fewer of the elementary logical units. And you'll have to teleport uh, teleport less, so you'll use less entanglement overall. But I mean, you know, there's only a gap of twelve between that and magic seven. Uh huh. And depending on how many uh, how many bell uh, bell pairs you need to pursue these distillation projects, that I could easily see the space overhead from from the distillation to be left out of that. Um. Or even well, I mean, again. this space of twelve is actually relatively significant, I guess, because we assumed like 100 qubits in ELU, but only 50 of them are data qubits, roughly. So like, you know, this is right at that boundary, whereas this is over. Uh, I mean, that, that is sort of uh, cheating, because like nobody actually has 100 qubit ELUs. And, um, <laughs> so who says those numbers are actually right? Um, um, yeah, I mean, I guess the short answer is I haven't really considered the entanglement distillation. Um, but, you know, my feeling is that they're all roughly comparable in the qubits, and like, you know, so they should all take roughly the same amount of entanglement distillation. I'm not sure why, like, one would take significantly more than the oh, other. I see, I see the point of comparison. You're not taking a look at, you know, doing entanglement distillation in this solution. You're doing it across a period across them. Okay, so then I've got the figure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the entanglement's all given. Um, the question is just how big are the circuits? And so we have some metric for the, for how big, you know, for size of circuits. 
Um, one of the, so one of these metrics is the circuit volume, which is where you just count the number of gates in the circuit and then weight by the number of qubits. So what I mean by that is like a single qubit gate is counted once, a two qubit gate is counted twice, and a three qubit gate is counted three times. Okay, so this is sort of a, you know, it's space times time roughly, uh, where time is measured in uh, whether a qubit is active or not during that time step. Um, and these are the rough circuit volumes. And we get like a factor of three or something better. Um, the space-time volume is the same thing, but you uh, actually take into account the, the times of the gates in microseconds, uh, like real, real experimental units, <laughs> um, whereas this is a more theoretical quantity. Um, so when you do that, we also see roughly a factor of three. Um, and then you can just look at the time of a circuit. Uh, you know, I, I like this one sort of least because you can often in these constructions, you can trade off time and space uh, by adding more qubits. Um, but if, you know, if we just stick with these pictures shown, then the times are roughly, you know, a factor of four or so. Um, yeah. Um, so we're not assuming it takes three times longer. We're actually assuming it takes the same amount of time, but we're counting we're counting the number of qubits that are involved in that um, in that gate. Um, yeah, how can they? Well, they actually gave this number in the paper. <laughs> um, so. You know, as far as that goes, I, I guess I trust it. Uh, but they have, you know, they have this momor sorensen interaction that can couple multiple qubits at one time. Um, right. Okay, yeah, I think that's that slide. So that's the overhead comparison. Um, and then the, the second comparison is in pseudo thresholds. Okay, so, uh, What's going on here is there's, there's two different error models, first of all. There's where all the gates fail with probability p, and then there's the error model where um, the, the like three qubit gate fails 10 times as often as the two qubit gate, which fails 10 times as often as the one qubit gate. Um, okay, so those are the two error models. Like this one's probably more realistic. Um, and the way we calculate these pseudo thresholds uh, well, let's explain the plot. This is the logical error rate, and then we divide out the leading order term. So the leading order term is p squared, and then you can you know, divide by 1,000 just to make the numbers over here nice. Um, so this isolates like the leading coefficient in the logical error rate. So the logical error rate is like you know, 11,000 times p squared here. Um, Right, and we can calculate these uh, using the XREC formalism. We can actually enumerate all the different ways that, that two gates can fail, and then count which ones are, are bad, which one cause logical errors. Um, so this is how we, we actually get upper and lower bounds on the logical error rate. So the real logical error rate is somewhere in here. Um, okay, so we've done that for the identity gate on the bacon shore code, the uh, identity gate on the surface code, um, the control Z gate on the bacon shore code, and the control control Z gate. Okay, so the bacon shore code is using the Steen error correction, whereas the, the surface code here is using um, the, uh, you know, the standard surface code error correction, uh, like seven, the 17 qubit surface code. Um, so Steen error correction is actually better than that because you don't have to repeat. So I think that's what's causing this difference here. Um, right, but so um, once you have these logical error rates, you can determine what's called a pseudo threshold by comparing with the like physical logical error rate. So the pseudo threshold is the point where these, these sort of cross. So that's what's being written here. Okay, 
Uh, and this is the, for the error model on the left. Um, if we also do the same thing for magic states, uh, we can take that seven qubit magic state circuit from the previous page and simulate all the ways the faults can happen and just count them up. And so Reiji has done this. And this is the, uh, the failure rate of the seven qubit magic circuit. Um, and it's roughly like four times larger than the, than the Bacon Short Control Control Z. Okay. Um, and we can do the same thing for the error model on the right and get the pseudo threshold values there. Uh, our bounds become pretty weak, actually. If you want to strengthen these bounds, you should count uh, more ways that gates can fail. But uh, this is like gets combinatorically more and more difficult. So uh, we didn't do that. <laughs> um, OK. Yeah, so I'm going to conclude now. Um, there's, I mean, as, as like quantum computers are getting closer to implementation, and like small codes, well, small codes are becoming more and more interesting because you know, these are the first things that, that will be implemented, and it, they'll basically be how we'll learn about fault tolerance in a, in a small experiment. Um, so that's our, explains our focus on distance three codes. It also makes it easy to, to optimize these constructions on distance three codes. Um, so, you know, what would make a small code a good candidate for, uh, for implementation, for early implementation? Well, first of all, it should be small in the number of qubits. Um, you should have error correction that you can do very fast. Um, and you should have a bunch of logical gates. So, you, um, you know, transversal ones are great. Uh, and hopefully it's universal. And uh, you also want some high, high pseudo threshold. Uh, so we can do this on like crappy hardware. Um, the Bacon short code has all of these. And one other thing I listed here was tomography. Um, it doesn't have logical tomography because you, it's very hard to measure logical why. Um, but maybe this isn't so big a deal. I mean, uh, it has a bunch of these criteria. Um, the service code doesn't necessarily have logical tomography either. Um, but I mean, in, in the end, this small code problem is very like hardware dependent. Um, so which code you can use depends on which couplings you have access to um, and which physical gates you have. Um, and you know, maybe if you have a lot of non-locality, then the Bacon short code case is a good choice because uh, you, know, you can do this control control Z that I've been advertising. Um, but it also depends uh, perhaps on which application you have in mind uh, because you want to uh, you want to use a code that has fault-tolerant gates that appear most often in your algorithms. You know, so uh, like the, the arithmetic portions of Shor's algorithm take a lot of control control Z gates or Toffoli gates because those are classical gates. Um, so a code with that is also well suited to, to such circuits. Um, yeah, so this is a you know, th this is a problem with lots of dependency, but uh, the Bacon Shore code might be a good candidate. Okay, so I'll, I'll leave it there and take further questions. Okay, thanks. So with the, uh, the question of the logical tomography, I just want yeah. to open this to the framework, because one of the things that I'm, I don't know if you use that, but it was just how to interpret what it means here, because if you've got an atomoid and PCC, then you're doing read at two qubit intervals. Yes. And so, you know, when you're doing tomography, you're keeping the Y implication values with the imaginary parts of the operator. Does that even make sense with an ideal logical uh, uh, read at uh, computation? Um, yeah, I guess it doesn't. Uh, you, you do have to measure. Um, I believe if you want to do full tomography of a rebit state, you should measure 
uh, pairs of y, y. Um, like you can't measure a single y, but y, y t tensor y is still a valid operation. Um, and I guess I don't immediately see how to measure y tensor y either. Um, it's a good point, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I haven't thought too much about it. Another issue mm -hmm. uh, regarding the, uh, the arithmetic. Mm -hmm. uh, what you really actually want is you really want the transverse approximate yield to be a little Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's not possible. Um, there was a recent paper by Newman and Xi that ruled out transversal topoly on many quantum codes. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> um, basically by using the fact that it's universal for classical computing. Yeah, I always suspected that there would be some sort yeah. of analog. Yeah. But that's cool. Yeah, and um, we can actually prove the same thing for stabilizer codes using our, uh, well, when I say R, I mean Thomas and Alex and me. Uh, have this disjointness paper recently came out, and we can rule out rule out transversal Toffoli on stabilizer codes. Um, yeah, so Toffoli seems uh, <laughs> seems unfortunately difficult. <laughs> um, control Control Z might be the best you get. Yeah, uh, I mean you can because you can like do that in encoding using the rem remote entanglement. Um, I mean it does create sort of logistical problems, I guess. Like, um, is, it, is it faster to measure something to measure uh, an operator with support to the inside of the loop or with support overlap? Um, it is faster, I guess, to measure support inside a unit. Like, like, let's assume that the entanglement is all set up to begin with. Um, then it's faster to measure inside the unit only by like some factor of uh, some constant factor because you have to teleport. Um, so it's not a big disadvantage. It's not well. The, the big disadvantage is making the entanglement to start with. <laughs> Which I have swept under the rug conveniently. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, maybe it's possible to like make entanglement as you're consuming it, but at a slightly slower rate. And um, yeah. I mean, since no one has built it, I guess they don't exactly know what to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it will consume entanglement to measure across code blocks. Comment on so on other architectures on the Allen cups actually a little bit less connectivity in there given ELU. Yeah. Have you studied what happens when you have maybe like a significant deal of better order? Um yeah, I mean because like the non locality here is so important, <laughs> um I'm not sure how you would how you would implement this in like superconducting. Um so I guess the, I could say that if you had a three-dimensional architecture, you could do this with local interactions. <laughs> um, but that's the, probably not surprising in light of you know, the color code and such. Um, but actually, you know, one way to interpret this transversal control, control Z, is that we're simulating a three-dimensional Bacon short code. And in the three-dimensional Bacon short code, uh, the CCZ is transversal if you're if you're allowed to have code blocks that are sort of rotated 90 degrees with respect to one another. Um, yeah, so um, I mean we know that by Bravi and Koenig that like local things in 2D aren't going to implement interesting things. <laughs> Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. I, So you transform into the. You can measure x, x, and z. Yeah. So, I mean, really, like, what does the sign by identity, or the identity matrix of what does it define by identity x and z? So, I mean, I don't see why you really need any y. I think yy is also because valid, though. X and z's. Are you allowing? But yy is real as well. Like you can multiply x and z. Yeah, uh, okay, so maybe there should be an asterisk next to the, the logical number. <laughs> so, uh, good point, good one point. Of the uh, well, I've actually looked at other, other small codes. In, uh, the, there was this paper I had with Isaac Kim when I was at IBM um, on, uh, we called them triangle codes, um, but they're essentially like three copies of a surface code joined together at a, uh, imagine you have the xy, the xz, and the yz planes, and each of these planes are surface codes. Uh, you can join them together at the, the corner of the origin. Um, so the smallest instance of this family is a seven qubit code, uh, which has distance three, and it encodes one qubit, and it's not the same as like the Steam code or anything. Um, so this is another interesting small code. And um, I, in, in that paper, I did a lot of comparison with, with other small layouts, like uh, you know, the five qubit code, or like the, um, I guess, the surface code, the bacon short code, the Steen code, um, and did sort of the XREC comparison with the, the pseudo thresholds as well. Um, yeah, so I, I've looked at quite a few small codes, and some of them were, were sort of new. <laughs> um, I, I, out of all of those, I really like the bacon short the best, but <laughs> um, maybe that's, you know, I've spent the most time on it, so <laughs> it's not fair. <laughs> Thanks.